At their 40th high school class reunion, Chet and Peggy were sitting near the door. She taps him on the arm and she whispers, look at the table over by the buffet. I think that's Henry Zimmerman. Can't be, Chet replies. That guy's way too old. Looks like he ought to be in a hospital. Suddenly the man in question stands and limps to their table. Harry, Peggy, it's good to see you again. They both smile and stare blankly. It's me, it's Harry, Harry Zimmerman. Harry, it's so good to see you. And for a while they chat about family and how the years have passed so quickly, health issues. And then he limps back to his table. Chet turns to Peggy with a look of half-sick pity and says, I would not have recognized him. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. As Eugene Peterson says, the word moved into the neighborhood. We look back at the Bethlehem scene and we wonder how anyone could have missed what was going on. It seems like such an attention-grabbing event. We can almost imagine a local newscaster saying, this just in, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born in a Bethlehem stable last night sometime after midnight. Due to crowded conditions in the local inn, Jesus' birth parents, Mary and Joseph, were forced to use a feed trough as their son's first cradle. The innkeeper was unavailable for an interview, but kept muttering, if only I had known. This is news, and we feel like everybody should know what's going on. But as the Bible says, the world did not recognize him. Our mental images of the nativity often make it as if everyone is aware. This is God's son being born. Go tell it on the mountain. And the fact is, except for that angelic announcement to a handful of very unimportant shepherds and the later arrival of the Gentile wise men, nobody even noticed that Jesus was born. They really expected something else. The Lord of creation, the God of the universe, arrived at his creation incognito. He had to. He was on a rescue mission. And coming as the Lord of glory would have scared away the very ones he came to rescue. I took this manger to the kids in the daycare this past Wednesday. Every Wednesday we get together and sing some songs and I tell a story. And I asked them what this was. Most of them had no clue. And one of the older kids probably about a first grader, said, isn't that where they put babies when they're born? <laughs> this picture we have of Jesus in the manger has such a holy aura about it that we've completely forgotten about the fact that this is just a feed trough. And the picture is so branded into our thinking and has been for centuries that we can lose sight of the fact that there's no mention of a stable or an innkeeper or animals. You mean I gotta go away and put my nativity set away? No, no, no. But let's keep in mind what the Bible says about what actually happened. When Jesus was born, Whatever it was that he was put into, and the Bible calls it a manger, a feed trough. It was a feed trough before that. It was temporarily borrowed as a cradle and worked very well 
for people who were too poor to afford anything else. And when Jesus left that manger, it became a feed trough again. For centuries, so many Jewish scholars had studied the prophecies and they drew certain conclusions about the coming of the Messiah. These were men who genuinely loved God for the most part and loved his word and they still got it wrong. They were really expecting something other than what God had in mind. In January of 2007, a young man emerged from the Washington DC Metro and positioned himself against a wall beside a trash basket. A youngish white man in jeans, a long sleeve t-shirt and a Washington Nationals ball cap on his head. From a small case, he took out a violin. Placing the open case at his feet, he shrewdly threw a few dollars and pocket change as seed money into the case and began to play. For the next 45 minutes, in the DC Metro, on January 12, 2007, he played Mozart and Schubert as over 1,000 people streamed by most hardly taking notice. Had they paid attention, they might have recognized the young man as the world-renowned Joshua Bell. They might also have noticed that the violin that he was playing there at the Metro, a rare Stradivarius worth over $3 million. What world-class violinist in his right mind takes a rare Stradivarius to the DC Metro. This was all part of a project arranged by the Washington Post, an experiment in context and perception and priorities. In this very ordinary setting at a very inconvenient time, would people notice beauty? Just three days earlier, Joshua Bell had sold out the Boston Symphony Hall with ordinary seats going for $100 in the subway. Bell garnered about $32 from the 27 people who stopped long enough to give a donation. People had no clue who this was. In the passage I read earlier today is the phrase, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. A contemporary Christian artist named Rich Mullins, killed a number of years ago in a Jeep accident, wrote a song about Jesus being a homeless man. And it's hard for us to connect some of the homeless people we've seen with Jesus. There's a disjoint there. I mean, at at least Jesus was clean and neat and he had a nice robe to wear. And then Mullins makes the point, the hope of the whole world rests on the shoulders of a homeless man. He came to that which was his own, and yet his own did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Be careful not to assume that just because we've been born on this planet means that we are automatically children of God. We are all creations of God, which he dearly loves, every single one of us. From the unborn infant to the most derelict homeless man, every single one of us is a handcrafted creation of God. Jesus came so that we could become children of God. We recognize in hindsight that the Bethlehem born infant was the Messiah. We can see those prophecies prophecies lining up. The question for us becomes, as we are waiting for the second coming, 
how do we recognize Jesus in daily life now? Those scholars got it wrong. Is it possible that we miss seeing Jesus? Take a look at the person next to you for just a couple of seconds, okay? And we're smiling because we think this is a really silly exercise and kind of embarrassing. I know who that is. And I'm telling you, that's not Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. And the Bible says, sure it is. As is that homeless man that you may bump into later this afternoon. Like the Bethlehem scene, we may not always recognize God's hand in the middle of something or his presence in a situation. I believe with a sanctified imagination, we can see Joseph and Mary with their newborn son. And if you've been there, you know that feeling. You could just stare at this newborn and just look and look and look and soak it in. This is our child. And along with that wonder comes the terror. This is God's son. How do you raise God's son? What if we mess up? It's not like we can take it back and get a refund. This is God's son. And so between the wonder and the terror, this was a night unlike anything they had ever known and ever would know. Things were not working out like they expected. Come on, a manger? This is God's son. Mary and Joseph did not think that things were working out the way they were supposed to. We know they did. As a matter of fact, if there was any other kind of ending to the Christmas story, we would know something was wrong. This is the way it's supposed to happen. They travel to Bethlehem. They can't find a room. The innkeeper gives them a place in the stable and he's born in the manger. That's the way it's supposed to happen. And Mary and Joseph in that scene are saying to themselves, no, this is not how it's supposed to happen. This is not what we were expecting. In your life, has anything happened that you did not expect? <clears throat> That's the norm. And what God is saying is right there, right there is where I am. You might not be able to see it now. Just like Mary and Joseph couldn't see it at that point, but trust me, I'm there. Here's what I'd like you to do. Think back to Christmas's past when things did not go the way you thought they should. Look back at that scene now and ask yourself, where was God in that? And it may be that with the passage of time, you're able to look back and realize, now I get it. Looking back to realize that what happened back then, God knew and had purpose. For a number of years, one of the favorite Christmas claymation specials was titled Martin the Cobbler. Remember claymation? Rudolph is still going strong. It's based on a story by Leo Tolstoy. Martin the Cobbler has a basement apartment in the city, and the only window in his apartment looks out at street level. His wife and young child died many, many years before, 
And for a while, he was so bitter with God, he wouldn't talk to God at all. And then a friend encouraged him. You can't live like this. Get into the word, read, listen. And so over time, Martin got back on talking terms with God again and began to realize, I need him in my life. And then one night, in the middle of reading the word, he got a very strong impression from the Lord. I'm going to visit you tomorrow. He got the place straightened up and was looking forward to this visit from Jesus the next day. Can you guess where this is going? The next day, an old veteran, a neighbor of his, was out shoveling sidewalks from the snow. And Martin looked through the window and thought to himself, well, Jesus is coming, but boy, he looks frozen. So he invited the veteran in for a cup of tea and they chatted. The veteran went on his way, but still no sign of the Lord. An old woman bent over, carrying a baby. She was wearing a very thin shawl, summer clothes actually, and it was bitter cold. He invited her and the baby in and explained, I'm expecting Jesus anytime, but please come in. Gave them something to eat. Suckled the baby with his finger and a little bit of milk. They chatted for a bit and she got warm and full from what she had, ate, had eaten. And then they left and still no sign of Jesus. Later in the afternoon, he noticed that there was a boy who was stealing apples out of a bag from a woman who sold them. And the woman saw him and grabbed him and began to scream at the top of her, top of her lungs, thief, thief. Martin ran out and took the boy by the shoulder and said, wait, 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 I'll pay for the apple. No, you can't pay for that apple. If we keep doing things like that to kids like this, they're gonna get spoiled. You know we need to really come down hard on ruffians like this. And Martin explained, Jesus died for him. I'll pay for the apple. And as he and the woman chatted, she began to explain about her seven children, one of whom was a girl, and they were all going a bad way because she couldn't afford what she felt they needed. And as they talked, she began to warm to Martin and realized that he understood what it meant to hurt. And so he paid for the apple, and as the woman hoisted the bag to carry it home, the boy said, can I carry that for you? It's right on my way home. And Martin went back to his basement apartment and no sign of Jesus. And as he turned to the New Testament, and his eyes happened to fall on a very familiar parable, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. When did we see you naked and hungry and tend your needs? And as he's reading this passage, he's thinking about the soldier and the woman with her child and the boy and the older woman. When you've done it to the least of these, finish the set verse for me. You've done it to me. Let's keep our eyes open, our spiritual eyes open for ways that Jesus wants to visit us incognito this Christmas. Probably today. Pray with me.